Mimosas with Michael. Mimosas with Michael. Mimosas with Michael. Yay! Hey everybody, it's Michael Colomb with Promosas with Michael, and um, I have a really cool guest this week. Uh, it's Brendan from Master Talk. Hey Brendan, how you doing? Hey Mike, good man. How about you? I'm doing good, and like this is really cool because because I work in film, I have a tendency to to interview a lot of filmmakers and actors. Um, but you're so completely different than whatever I had on the show before, so I'm really excited because you have a YouTube channel called Master Talk, uh, and it's really all about public speaking, right? You got it. Yeah, I was checking it out. It's really cool. I actually, I don't know if you can tell by talking to me, but I have no problem talking to people. I have no problem. I excel in communication. I love it. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm probably a rare breed in that sense. I would imagine most people probably have a hard time with public speaking. Very so true. What, so what can Brandon from Master Talk help them do to feel better about public speaking? Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's start the conversation here. Where does the fear of public speaking come from? Right? When for some reason, a lot of us, not you, but most of us, have to be scared. Like in my case, I grew up in Montreal, where I'm from. So in that city, you need to know how to speak French. So I got put into a French education system. Well, guess what? I didn't know how to speak French. So not only was I uncomfortable with presentations, I had to give presentations in a language I didn't even know. Oh, so, my, so clearly, if, if someone like me can master public speaking, anyone can too. So where does the fear of public speaking come from? Well, the answer is fairly simple. Where do we present most of the time? The answer is generally school. We don't wake up one morning and go, hey, Mike, you want to get breakfast and present all day? Like nobody says that or nobody does that. Really? It happens, like, I feel like that happens in my life all the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're like an actor slash director slash movie guy. So maybe I'm like a one-man kidding. show. Yeah, I'm a one-man show. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> so for you, that would be exciting. But I would say for 90% of the people listening, definitely yeah. not the funnest thing in the world. They'd probably rather go to a beach or something. So that's the idea. So whenever we present, let's say we're in high school, they give us a high school presentation on the Renaissance, right, in history. Yeah. You know, we do our best. We give a presentation. We don't do that great. Why? Three reasons. One, we never get to pick the topic, and we're generally never passionate about the topic. Two, the students that are listening to us don't care, not because they don't like us. They love us. That's not the issue. The issue is they're worried about their own presentation because they got to go in five minutes. Yeah. And so they're thinking about their own time period of history. They're not worried about yours. And then third, teacher's really smart, well-educated, well-intentioned. But guess what? She or he is really stressed. They have to go with the 30 presentations in two classes. They don't have time to sit you down and go, hey, Mike, let's talk about your presentation skills for 10 minutes. Like, no. Yeah. So you have teachers who can't coach because they, they're stressed out of their minds. You have students who don't care because they're worried about their own presentation. You have topics that we don't get to pick or are passionate about. But the punchline is that doesn't just happen in history. English, sciences, math, English, uh, music, gym, on and on and on. We're taught to believe that public speaking is a chore. A and it sucks because you kind of take that into like your workplace. Exactly. You know, so so you, you're like, you have this big presentation and you just buckle under the pressure because you're like, you couldn't do it back in school. And now you're, you know, you might have a big presentation you got to give. And that's just like more because before you did it for a grade, but now you're doing it for your, like your livelihood. I can imagine Absolutely. it's probably even more stressful. You got it, man. So it's, okay. it's always an obligation. We don't see it as something fun to do. Rather than like this conversation, we're using public speaking as a tool to impact people, to help some people out, to get yeah. them more acquainted with communication. Most people don't see it that way. We see it as a chore. So no wonder we're scared of public speaking. No wonder it's something we don't like to do. So how did Brandon from Master Talk decide to create Brandon from Master Talk? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you a, know, like the meta question. Well, it's just, I mean, it's like, because I always get that, that question, like, how did, how did Michael get into film? And it, it wasn't like I woke up one day and I was like, I want to, I mean, that's probably not entirely true. I did wake up and actually want to do this, but it wasn't like, like the, the specific career path I took sort of deviated and, and took, and I kind of went with it, but like, 
how did you get started or like what was your like like zenith for starting it yeah absolutely i love the word zenith I kinda thanks like, oh. <laughs> just like i was trying to think of a better word but you know it's no it's good man so yeah when i was in university i used to do these things called case competitions so think of it like commute professional sports but for nerds so while people okay. like football or soccer or baseball, you know, other guys my age would watch sports or eat chicken wings and watch sport games. I would eat yeah. those same chicken wings, the same junk food. But instead of watching sports games, I would watch presentations. So I know this okay. is weird, but I did this competitively. So in three years, I presented over 500 times, coached over 75 people on public speaking, and competed myself in 50 or 60 of these competitions. So I was a nutball. And the same way other people look at sports statistics, I would look at how other people are introing from other schools and then like criticize them, then mock their presentations and make it all better. And the reason I did that, because most of the people who do case competitions go on to get the top corporate jobs out of university, so from yeah. business school. So think about people on Wall Street. Think about consultants at McKinsey or Bain or BCG or IBM and all that stuff. So most of us compete for those reasons, but then after we get obsessed with it, we start to care a lot about presentations. So anyways, when I started working in consulting after I graduated, I kind of asked myself, what can I use with my time and expertise to make a difference in the world? And that's when the idea for the channel came, because a lot of people, frankly, suck on YouTube on public speaking tips and skills, and I wanted yeah. to make something better than what was already out there. Well, that's actually, that's kind of a cool idea. And it, it's not like you're not doing beauty tips, you're not doing like, a TikTok video, really? like you're, I know. Well, I'm just, you know, it's like that's what seems to be so popular is like makeup tips or like just anything sort of random like that. Or um, I also study photography, so a lot of people talk about like tips on photography. But like you're doing something that like a lot of people wouldn't think about doing because no one really wants to tackle public speaking, probably because nobody really likes it or they're, they're terrified. But you know, it's like it's interesting because there are a lot of people right now who are vloggers and people vlog, but they're talking to an, invi an invisible audience, right? Per se, unless they're doing live feed. But even then it's not like, like there's something so different about standing in front of people you don't know and seeing them and hearing their reaction. It's so visceral as opposed to like a camera, right? So I, I think it's very fascinating. And I was watching your channel and, and yeah, it's kind of cool. Of course, it's funny because I've never had an issue with public speaking. I mean, I've been performing since I was five, so being in front of right. people. But um, but I do find that that people get nervous and they, they lock up, they freeze with that fear. And so like, how, how do you tell people to sort of get past that fear? Right, so I think a good comparison here is you versus someone who's scared of public speaking. The yeah. simple reason why you're not scared is because you never saw it as a chore. You're like, performing's oh, yeah. fun. I yeah. like going out. I like, you know, I'm not, th I'm not the best at it. Now you probably are. But like at the beginning, you're like, yeah, you know, it's cool. You know, I mess up. Life goes on. But most people never go through that exercise. So if you think about me, if I never competed in competitions, I would never be as good or good enough to teach public speaking. Because my whole life, I saw it as a, I actually saw it worse than a tour. I saw it as a, a like a, like a sentence, like a prison sentence. Oh, yeah. I would present in, in a language I didn't know. So when I was in grade four, five, six, et cetera, I wouldn't know the language. So I would be terrified whenever I go up on stage, or which in this case was the classroom. But the shift for me happened later in life. For you, it happened really early. For me, it was when I was 19, 20. Because when I started doing competitions, I was like, this is fun. Like, I want to be really good at communication. And then it just became this obsession. You know, I started obsessing over every little vocal variation and tone and all that stuff. One thing led to another, and I learned 40 years of communication experience in three. That's, a, that's awesome. Yeah. I want to – are you are you not feeling good, my friend? Oh, yeah. I'm just uh, writing notes. Life you goes guys, on, I, you know. Well, mo this is mostly a podcast, but there are some videos. So for the people who aren't, who, who aren't watching, this poor guy is sick. But he, want, he took time out to, um, to talk with you guys, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. No, of course. It's not a big deal. I mean, you know, sometimes you just got to do – the show's got to go on. Of course. Of course. Um, so I don't know. I don't have to ask you. Like, I, I understand public speaking. I think it's, I mean, it is nerve wracking and you're right. Like if someone gives me a topic that I don't know, I, it's mortifying. Cause I'm like, and half the time it's like, you may not know where to get the, the information or like there's certain kind of, I remember when I was taking speech class or certain kind of speeches I just didn't like. I love co contemporary. Like you can just throw me up there and I can talk about anything all day long. I have no problem with that because 
my mind just thinks like that. And I've, I've, pre- I've been an award presenter. I mean, I, you know, I've done acting and stuff so I can do that. But like, even for me, there's probably certain kinds of speeches or debates I, I couldn't do. So I can understand that. What kind of, um, I don't know. I, I just, so many questions I don't ask you. I don't even know where to like buckle it down. But um, I like one point that you mentioned there. Like, how do you speak when you haven't prepared for a speech? Then that's really interesting. So yeah. how about we do this exercise really quick? This is something people could do on a daily basis. Give me a random word. You want a random word? Butterfly. Butterfly, awesome. So what I need to do with this word is I need to create a presentation out of thin air. Here do I, here I go. Evolution throughout the history of time has never been easy. Whether it was the way that us humans evolve, whether it's the way that other species evolve, or even if it's a tiny butterfly, the process and the evolution of that butterfly is much more complex than meets the eye. From the small little caterpillar that it starts its journey off into the cocoon that it uses to spread its wings and fly. And as this evolution continues in our lives, we also need to think about how that evolution applies to us. Are we going to spend every day stuck in our cocoons, stuck as little caterpillars? Are we going to learn to fly one day and pursue what we're actually meant to do? And that's exactly what I'm going to show you today. So notice how I just completely just did that in thin air. This is what we call the random word exercise. You pick a random word, five, five words for five minutes every day, lamp, laundry, you know, wife who's mad at you, husband who's mad at you, whatever you want to do, and you create presentations out of thin air. This gets you into that discomfort that you were alluding to. Oh, nice. No, it's definitely, I think that's definitely good, especially for people who have to do it. No, I mean, not just in school, but like in the workplace, because, you know, it's like, especially if it's your first time, you know. Do, would you practice, would you say you'd want to practice it in front of a mirror, or does that make people more nervous? Because have you seen that before, like in movies, or like they practice in front of a mirror? And I used to do that too sometimes when I was practicing smiling for competition, which is pretty advanced for most people. But I would yeah. say at the beginning, just just pick random words for fun and just do it alone in your basement. And then you could move to a partner giving you a word because it's oh, more okay. stressful when you give me the word, right? Because I don't know what you're going to say. And then after that, then you could start practicing in front of the mirror and stuff. And, but I would recommend recording yourself. That's more effective. Okay. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, kind of like what, what we do in film. You kind of just record yourself. How long have you been um, doing your YouTube channel? So I've been coaching people since I was 19, 20. So probably like five years now I'm going on. But, I was, uh, but for YouTube specifically, I started the channel 18 months ago. Okay, so you're fairly, you have a good following for 18 months. That's, that's, how, you know, that's how you know you fit something that people really need. I appreciate it's like, that. Yeah, there's a market for it. So was that like when you were a kid, you were just like, I want to be a, a, a motivator? Like what? Like, what did you want to be when you were a kid to, like, where you are now? I just find, oh, yeah. I just find this, this journey fascinating, just so you know. Of course. No, I want to be an accountant. I really? To get out. Yeah, all I cared about was getting out of poverty. So the, for the only thing that I wanted in life was being happy and making money because my parents never had any, right? So what I kept focused. Yeah, I'm sorry, where did you grow up at? Oh, I just, oh, no, I grew up in Montreal. Like, same. I wasn't, like, dead poor, but I meant in the sense, you know, I put both of my parents at minimum wage you know, workers. So it's difficult for them to, you know, provide, you know, amazing living for, for me and my sister. So I kind of just said, oh, I just want to make money. I wasn't like a master talk. Uh, oh yeah, let me join the circus or something. No, I was very practical and frankly boring. But then as time went on and as I got better in communication, all that stuff, then when I entered business school, I just fell in love with it. And then my next goal after I got the job in accounting was to be like a, a senior level executive at a company. So clearly okay. not... Not like YouTuber, not like public speaking guy. I wanted to work at McKinsey. I wanted to work at IBM. I wanted to work yeah. at Boston Consulting Group. I wanted to be an advisor to CEOs. So then, you know, I got the job I wanted. But obviously, to get that job, I needed to like go through all of those case competitions, all of those experiences, so I can speak like a senior vice president, but like at 2021, 20, right? Yeah. Which is ridiculous, crazy if you think about it. And a lot of the people who competed were exposed to that too. We're talking like people would fly out from like Bangkok, Thailand, spend $10,000 to enter the competition, hotels, accommodations, all that stuff. Their school wow. funnels everything just for them to give PowerPoint slides. That was the world I was in. Damn, I'm in the wrong business. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was, it was a good time. I really enjoyed it. But it was, yeah, go ahead. No, I want $10,000 for a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> 
Especially because I suck at PowerPoint. Exactly. It, it was nuts, right? But the, but the reason why the fees were so high, but obviously the students never paid. The university was the one who, who of lowered it. Yeah. Um, the reason is because it's glory, you know, because you, you bring the top students and you make, you make your school proud. That's one. So it's PR. Second reason, it's more compelling. The companies who sponsor the cases want all the students in the competitions because they're like the 1% of all of the business faculty students. So it's oh, a yeah, my university. There's 8,000 students in the business faculty, but only 80 people in the program. Right? So oh, wow. you have people like Walmart. So Walmart was a case sponsor two, three years ago. They paid 25 grand to sponsor the case because they wanted all the best people. So, but the guy who's presenting the case was explaining the case to the students. It's not some manager. It's not like some dude who started at Walmart two years ago. It's a senior vice president for Walmart Canada sticking yeah. his weekend to be there with a bunch of 20 year olds. Cause he's like, I want you. And he gives a bunch of job offers to the people he wants to pick up. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fascinating. Yeah. That's fascinating. Different Such world. Di yeah. I was just about to say literally a different world than what I'm used to. Yeah. That's kind of cool. So, so you do coaching now full time. No, actually. So, so that's my, so it's still my side hustle. I was supposed to leave my job this year, but are you, I got are you finally an accountant? No, I'm a, I'm a technology consultant at IBM. Actually. Okay. Okay. Perfect. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just, when I think about like the things that young boys think when they want to be like, like I want to be a fireman or an astronaut or like a doctor, but I, I probably wanted to be a writer, but no one ever says they wanted to be an accountant. So I think that's funny. No, it, this is why Michael, they don't do that. Cause most people, and this is just true with anybody. They just want to do what everyone else is doing. This is what we call mimetic behavior. Anyways, I don't want to get too technical here, but the idea is simple. Oh, Michael's doing film. All my friends are doing film. I'm going to do film. Oh, YouTubers are doing makeup. I'm going to do makeup because it worked. But they don't actually do what they want to do. So for me, it was simple. When I was 12, I looked at my report card and I looked at all the career possibilities and I aligned both my interests and my strengths. And I realized really quickly on my report card that I failed pretty much everything except for math. I was a math whiz. I was getting 90s and everything. But every other subject... It's pretty garbage, at, frankly. So when I looked at all the career paths, I just said, oh, I should be an actuary or an accountant. But then I read the job description of an actuary. And I was like, you, you calculate the statistics of someone dying. I was like, you know what? I think I'll leave this one for another lifetime. Yeah. Through that, it became an accountant. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, it's like film. I mean, you know this, man. Like so many people go into film. They're like, I want to be like a film. And most of them fail because they don't actually know what, what that entails. Well, it's funny because I never... I mean, I, I think subconsciously I wanted to go into film. It was never like when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I actually wanted to be a performer and a writer. So I kind of started singing at the age of five, and I started writing at 10. And what was interesting about me is when most kids were on the playground doing, like, handball or jump rope, I was like – I had a clipboard with, like, paper, and I was writing. Like, it was such – I was such a nerd back then. Like, I love of, that. But it was, and I would actually, like – start stories like at recess and I go into class and finish them. And, um, and I've told stories so many times, like, like uh, in the eighth grade, we watched gone with the wind and we had this assignment where we had to write the sequel. Like what would happen? Like would you know, Rhett come back or all these things. And I asked my teacher and I was like, uh, like how long can the assignment be? And she's like, well, it only has to be like half a page or a page. I was like, I have some ideas like, give me a maximum number. She's like, I don't know, 10 pages. And I was like, okay, good. I wrote eight pages. Cause I'd so like, and I'm in the eighth grade and everybody else doesn't give a shit. Right. Because they're just like, who gives a shit about this movie? Right. And I'm like, and I went to another English teacher that I knew and I was like having her look at my grammar. Like I was obsessed with this thing. And I remember being in class and I was like trying to finish it up. And my, my friend was sitting in front of me and goes, what are you doing? I says, I'm trying to finish my assignment. He goes, Jesus, you have like eight pages. And I was like, I do. I have so many ideas. The teacher goes, A, like it didn't even matter because like I wrote eight pages. So that's when I knew at the age of like 10, I needed to be a writer. Um, so, um, but I, it's interesting because I think about what you're saying, like everybody around me wasn't like that. Like they didn't, you know, they had like normal, what they thought were normal goals. Like no one wants to go into an office and be like a, a receptionist. And I never, never fault anybody for doing that because Sometimes you have to, like, if you're married, you have kids, you have to do responsible stuff. I'm not married. I don't have kids. But I also, like, didn't – I used to live with my grandmother when I was a kid, and she worked, like, three jobs in order to pay her bills. And I just never, ever wanted to, to, 
I learned so much from what it, it did to her. And I always wanted, I didn't care if I failed. I just wanted to follow my dreams. Um, but it's crazy how like when you follow your dreams, you're not really failing. Like it's so interesting. You just, I somehow get, so that's how I got into film. It was like, I just wanted to be a writer. And then like I got into film and then I was good at it. So I don't know. That's my story, but it's kind of tiny to what you're saying. I want to break some things there. So, so what, what you also, cause this is what insane people don't really realize. They go, oh yeah, you know, I tried film, you know, it worked out for me. I got lucky. And I'm just like, no, you didn't. Right? No, I'm not saying I didn't work hard at it. I don't want right. you to think that I'm not thinking. But, but that's the point I'm driving is like, there is an alignment be- be- between your obsession and it was obvious that you were going to win in many ways because you were yeah. just really obsessed with that. And here's a quote that I love that kind of, I think really summarizes really, well, two things. One is, I love this, is the following. Never ever talk to boring people or be boring to other people. This is a quote I've lived by, right? Yeah. That's because I, I think I'm love- the least boring person. I never shut up. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I know. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, he's like, I've known you for 10 minutes and I'm already Yeah, I'm just like this guy. So that's one part. The second one is let's understand, because I want to poke a little holes there, what being normal actually means. Let's like define that for everybody. Just we're all on the same page. Okay. You're probably overweight divorced uh your kids probably don't like you you're in a job that you hate you have no direction in your life and you're probably going to die at a younger age than most do you really want to be uh, normal that sounds pretty stupid. for a second i thought you were saying all that stuff would be personal. i was like wow. not normal. <laughs> but that's what uh, normal gets you yeah so so my advice to people is yeah you can start there i started there i was just a normal you know kid trying to get a job trying to provide ends meet but once you get over that hump of surviving one day whether it takes five years, 10 years, two years, one year, then I want you to ask yourself, what do I do now? And most people will just say, okay, we're done. But a small percentage of people like you or other mm-hmm. people go, oh, let me start this podcast. Let me just do this film. Let me do this. Let me go do this. Or simply, you know, I'm going to intentionally use this time out of work to do this, to start a movement, to write a book, but mm-hmm. make that decision. Don't just spend your, 100% of your life doing what everyone else is doing. It's funny. I want to. I want to say two things now to piggyback on that. It's interesting that you should say that because when the pandemic hit, uh, now when I'm not filming, I usually even if I'm off, I still wake up at like nine o'clock and I start my day. Like that's my work. It's really easy for me because I just roll out of bed and my desk is right there. So it's you know, Same I'm already yeah, I'm already already early to work. But I so when the pandemic hit, I was like already doing, like it didn't hit me as hard because I was already working from home. I already had it sort of function. But now I was just like, well, I don't have any other excuses because I don't have to be anywhere and I can't go anywhere. So I just kept working. And it's so funny because people are like, like, you just do so many things. And I go, I get so fucking bored. Like I have to, like my mind has to create stuff. It, it's insane. And it's the only thing that's kept me sane through this whole thing. But what I want to say is this. I remember when I quit my job um, and I was older, I was about 30 when I quit my job. Sure. And uh, I remember going through like I just came out of human resources and I kind of sat down on my desk and I had no you have to understand like I had no plan it was just like if I don't do it today I'm never going to do it and I sat there and then it's just when I made the decision it's like life happened like it just it took control but what was interesting is I remember walking through the office and people just looked at me and they're like you just quit your job and I was like yeah and they're like what are you gonna do and I was like I don't fucking know I said I just know I can't do this I said, I'll, I'm going to make movies. I've been studying. By this time, I was studying how to be a script supervisor. I said, I've always wanted to be a writer. I'm just going to do it. And they, people would just look at me. They're like, wait, 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 you can do that? I was like, I think so. Like, I don't, yeah. I said, of course you can. And they just looked at me like, it's like they were never, ever taught that it was okay to, like, follow your dream. Exactly. And it's so crazy. And I got to let my family, let, but I can't even begin to tell you the amount of pushback that I got when I, because I was a little bit older, and I got I had a, a I had a job. I didn't have a career. Now I have a career, which I like. But it's very interesting, like how much pushback I got, and I had to push back even harder. And it was so crazy how like when you break away from that like norm, people it's like they just don't right. They can't compute. It's the crazy. And I was the first person I think in my family to like become a freelancer. And for the longest time, it was just like. I was like a unicorn. They're like, what are you? Chris, now my whole family's been on set. They've all met the celebrities, so they're fine. Now they're cool with it. But I'm telling you, man, for the first like five years, bro, it was 
they're like, what are you doing? Like, what were you thinking? And I was like, I was just thinking I couldn't die what I was doing. So that's what I told people. I said, look, I never, I always think everybody should follow the dream. I understand that you have obligations and that like, if you have kids, I'm, I think you're a hero in that sense because you want to give your kid a better life. But I, what I told these people was, is I understand that you can't do it. Just please pave the way so your kids can do it. And that's what I always tell people because it was not the easiest decision, by the way. It's never easy to break away from the norm. I cannot tell you. It was probably that's the, first of all, I, it kept me up at night for months, months. But the defining factor I remember was I was so, I was having the, one of the worst days at work and I went to lunch and I came back and I couldn't even open like the building. I just sat in front of the door for like 10 minutes and it was just like, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it, man. And I had to call my dad to like motivate me to go back into the building because I just couldn't do it. Well, that's when I was like, it's probably time to figure this out. So I just, I just like to tell that story because not that it's anything to do with public speaking, but I do find that I think one of the things that people don't want to follow their dreams for us is I think they're afraid of failing. And I don't know, we could tie this in with, with public speaking. Public People don't want to do it because they're always afraid of failing. And I don't know why people have such a weird mindset about that. Mm. Do you find that a lot when you talk to people? Or mo- or yeah, no, absolutely, man. You, you hit on a lot of great points. I think the number one reason that people don't go after what they want is simple. Their brain is not designed to do that. And their societies are not designed to do that. Yeah, that's so think about it. Like Our brain is wired for survival, not happiness. And look, the best way to survive is to do what everyone else wants them to do. Because, hey, if Michael is judging me for leaving my job, well, I want Michael to be my friend. I want him to stay in my circle. So I'm just going to do what he does because that's the best way for me to survive, to keep my friend group. So here's the advice I have for people. And this is a quote that I live by. Be insane or be the same. If you want to be like everyone else, it's totally fine. You go do that. Uh But if you want to do something different, you need to learn the art, because it's an art, not a science, of being more insane. What does that mean? It means, and this is a homework I can give people that people won't do, two exercises. One, write your own funeral speech. (laughs) Nobody does it. Write it. Write your own. Like, write it. I haven't thought about about doing that, but it's so damn I don't think you need to do it. I think you're fine. You're on the right track. I'm talking about the people who are listening. Write the funeral speech. If you can do that, you're going to get a lot more clarity in your life. You're going to figure out what's actually important. Two is communicate the weird things that you do on a daily basis that are not illegal to everyone around you. Why is this an important drill? The important, it's important because everyone is weird, but we choose not to communicate the weirdness. But when we start to do that, this is what happens. 90% of the people that you thought were your friends weren't your friends. They were your friends of the image of who you projected to be. So you need to find out who that 10% of the people who actually like you are. So this is what I did when I was 17 or 16 or something. Much younger, actually. I don't remember. I just went up to people and told them what I like to do. So I dance alone in my basement an hour a day. I can karaoke in eight different languages while speaking three. I love Justin Bieber. I don't know why people hate on him so much. The music's pretty good. But anyways, that's the thing. I say all these weird things. But the, the thing I want to draw importance to is not what I'm saying because it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But the confidence I'm projecting to what I'm saying. That took a long time for me to be comfortable of like talking about my own karaoke in my basement. And I live it. I'm literally talking to you while sitting on my mattress in my mother's basement. And I don't plan on moving out until I'm 31, but I make a six figure income. So why don't I own a car? And why didn't haven't I left my house? Because all of those decisions seem crazy to society, but to me, they make perfect sense. Yeah. But I want everyone to get to that place. I want everyone to say, why do we need to get married? Why do we need to have two and a half kids? Why are we saving up for retirement at 65 if Steve Jobs died at 56? How does mm-hmm. any of this make sense? And no, that's so true. Yeah. And that's what's scary is like, it's like we spend, we spend our whole life working for like maybe 10 years of retirement if we're lucky. If we're lucky. Yeah. You know, and, and it's kind of true. Yeah. So that's what I th- like. That's why I mean, and it's so interesting because I don't, I mean I don't look it. I'd like to say I'm 45. I left my job at the age of 30. I'm telling you, in those 15 years that I've worked in film, I lived twice as long as the 30 years before I got. And it's crazy because I look at the things I did, and everything before film feels like a, a whole other life. 
Like I can't, it's, and I tell people, I go going, following my dream gave me 10 years of my life. Like it really did. It sounds strange, but I, I can't even begin to tell you like, like I look back like just through the last 15 years and, and I have a manager now. My manager goes, no one's like, you have a bigger resume than most people. I go, I know I was just having fun. Like he wasn't even thinking about building my resume. I was just having fun. I was doing what I loved and I was meeting great people and I was having, and, and like, it's funny because people were like, you know, we love that you're good at your job. We just keep hiring you because you're fun to have on set. Like, I can tell you that I worked in an office for years. And no, I used to have fun. I tried to have fun in an office and I got in trouble all the time. They're like, this is work. You're not supposed to have fun. I was like, well, I don't want to die young. I used to get, and I'm going to tell you something. I used to watch people. So every day you come in at eight o'clock in the morning, right? You go to the, good morning, Michael. And they just like pour their coffee and like, oh, is it five o'clock yet? You're like, no, we just got here. <laughs> you know, it's like by Wednesday, they're like, oh, I wish it was Friday. I was like, how can you, it's like at the beginning of the day, they want it to be the end of the day. And then by Wednesday, they want it to be the end of the week. And I was like, this is why life went so fast. It's because they weren't really, you know, and now that I'm in film, I get to travel the world. I have to, you know, and I never, and most of the time I don't have to pay for, which I love, you know, people just like, Hey, we need you to get on a plane and be gone for, and it's really, I could be gone for five weeks. And then, you know, and it's like, and I will tell you, there's nothing like having two days to put your life on hold for five weeks. I, there's nothing like it. Kind of exciting in a lot of ways. So, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think stuff like that really stuck in my head because I was just like, I don't, I don't want this to be my life. Um, and again, I want people to understand I don't fault them, but I also want people to understand that like there are all alter alternatives that people never think about doing. And I remember I've had so many people go, I just want to live your life. And I was like, I don't, it's, it's harder than you think. You know, this isn't, not everybody wants my specific life. It takes a lot of like devotion and, but I love it because I'm doing case in point. I remember um, my nephew visited me on set one time and then we went and had lunch with like one of my friends who, you know, was a big horror writer and stuff. And um, we went back to my mom's house and she was like, you know, how was your day? She's like, oh my God. She's like, He's like, I just want this to be my life. And she's like, that's not a normal life. And I was like, no, that's, it is my life. That's my life. Like I just live it every day. Like it's just who I am. And it was, that was such a powerful moment when like it, it can't be normal because that's what I want. I don't know if that makes any sense, but no, it makes perfect sense, dude. And I, just and I, hope, I hope the same for everybody, you know, like, like, like you, like I learned from guys like you who kept telling me, you know, I quit my job at 30 and I was like, I better get my things straight at 22. And I started the YouTube channel right away, right before I started working. Now I, you know, it's so funny because I feel like it's funny because there are times that I wish I had, I had done it earlier because I knew I'd be further along, but I also knew that if I didn't have those, those like my years, because in my twenties, I actually helped my sister take, I, I helped raise my nephews a little bit. I try to be around them a lot. Um, and I kind of was finding myself, but I, I think that at 30, I was at the perfect age because I feel like there's so many life lessons I learned in 20 that when I hit 30, it was just like, I was so focused. It's hard. It's, you really can't pull me away from my, like everybody's utterly, utterly surprised at how, how focused I am. But it's because at the age of, like in my 20s, I wasn't as focused. I made all my mistakes. So I don't know. It's everybody's life is different, but. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But what you. I try to do, which is what you try to do, is I try to be a sort of motivator and sort of like um, guy. I never thought I would be. I mean, no one ever used to give a shit about what I had to say. And now I'm a guest on podcasts and people are hey, always. Hey, look at you. <laughs> it's crazy. It's cr no, it's great. So I do, but I get it. I get motivated by young people people like you because um you remind me of why i did it right and so it kind of it's kind of a a reason to keep going because it's like i have to be i helped pave this this sort of road for you guys to, to come along and it's like i have to keep paving that road for you guys to keep going on your journey absolutely so. And, and one thing I want to push for people is like, I know you're probably looking at me and Michael right now and you're saying, oh, you know, but I can't quit my job. I got all this stuff. Look, I'll, I'm literally happy to be transparent here. I am the only breadwinner in my house. I pay my mother's mortgage. I retired my mom, my sister. I pay all of her education. That's why I haven't left my day job because I haven't fully replaced my income yet. But just because I have a day job, just because I work 60 hours a week at my day job doesn't make is there's no excuse that means i still make the i still make the side hustle work like i'm doing right now i'm literally yeah. on a podcast today just today right yeah. so what's the message here the message is even if you only had one hour in a day in a week you know in a month 
work on something outside of it. And it doesn't need to be a business. It just needs to be something that you want to work on that's meaningful to you. And I hope you yeah. all do that. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to, um, to end the show. I like that. Thank you. Because I have a tendency to talk a lot, but I am, um, man, you're very inspirational. So thank you so much. Dude, I likewise, think a lot man. of people, uh, I think a lot of people can learn from you. Uh, we're definitely going to keep in touch, but how can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. I always, I always, I'm, th usually I say this normally, but this I really mean. I'm definitely not famous like Michael over here, you know, flying out the celebrity. So feel I'm hardly famous. I'm, hardly, I'm very humble in that sense. He's the so famous no. guy right here. But anyways, message me on Instagram at Master Your Talk. I'm very accessible. I answer all my DMs. So if you have any questions, comments, complaints, insults, don't be shy to just throw them over. Always yeah. happy to look into that. And if you want to check out my YouTube videos where I share a lot of public speaking tips that I coach a lot of my high level people on for free, yeah. check out on my YouTube channel, just master talk in one word. Yeah. And we'll definitely put it down on the show notes. Dude, you're an inspiration. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your crazy busy schedule. I was wondering why you wanted to film on the, on the weekend, but now it makes sense. You work 60 hours a week. Yeah. <laughs> good for you, man. I really look forward to uh, hearing more of what you're doing and, and keeping in touch, man. You're, you're good people. So. Of course, brother. Thank you. Likewise, man. Yeah. So everybody, uh, check out Brandon from Master Talk. We'll put all this stuff on the show. And uh, this is Michael Colomb with Mimosas with Michael. You can find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or on iTunes, YouTube. Uh, if, it, if there's a podcast anywhere, you're going to find us. So, um, and then, yeah, reach out, comment below, let us know uh, what you thought about Brandon. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>